All right, I've got 12 o'clock, so why don't we go ahead and get started? I want to welcome everybody to Medical Grand Rounds here at the University of Colorado. It's a uh, semi-live version, so we've got some people in person. Most people are on Zoom still. We'll to see if this, uh, how this works out for us. Um, today is a very special lecture. It's our Thomas A. Neff lecture. I want to start by saying I have no uh, DOM announcements for you today. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to ask questions, uh, not the chat, and the chief residents, myself, will monitor those for... Uh, discussion at the end of Dr. Dracy's talk. Uh, I want to also remind people that you receive uh, CO, CME as well as mock credit for all medical grand rounds. You can get up to 40 credits per year. So if you need those, please make sure to claim them. And Kelly Rodard will put the link in the chat. And I want to first introduce Dr. Ivor Douglas, professor of medicine here at the University of Colorado, an ICU expert at Denver Health, uh, to introduce the NEF lecture. Thank you so much. It's nice to be over at the campus and actually see colleagues in person as well as virtually. I'm Ivor Douglas. Um, my role is as associate as the uh, second chief of pulmonary critical care at Denver Health. And it's really a delight to um, note Mark Geraci's return, our previous division chief and much celebrated colleague who we were delighted to have visit with us across at Denver Health this morning as the first part of the annual NEF visiting lecture. Um, as a reminder, as we do most years, it's our privilege to commemorate the life and contribution of Tom Neff, who was the founding director of the pulmonary service at what was then Denver General Hospital. Uh, and Tom Neff's career was really illustrious. After uh, training at Northwestern and completing a period of time as a combat physician in Vietnam, he then moved here to Colorado to complete his Colorado his pulmonary fellowship and was really the founder of the early ICUs here in Colorado with Tom Petty and others, and was really well established and renowned for being a verifiable uh, master clinician and expert pulmonary physiologist to the point that on rounds this morning, those, of, uh, those are my colleagues who work directly with Tom and Mark will talk to this in a minute, were really recounting uh, you know, what it was like to work with Tom and learn from Tom and be intimidated by Tom, also known as being neft. Dr. Mark Moss has warm recollections of being neft for a long time in Dr. Neff's office, being rejoined re re by details of pulmonary physiology. Most importantly, he was truly one of the early leaders on establishing standards for the delivery of long-term oxygen therapy. And with Tom Petty's group and the Oxygen Consensus Conferences, really established that field in a resounding way. Most sadly, Tom Petty died all too early of a lymphoma um, and really worked almost to the end uh, of his life uh, clinically. Um, I want to just highlight that, uh, that the Neff family endowed not just this lectureship, but also a, an award to the, a um, deserving undergraduate from the Department of Medicine. And I want to just read in two sentences the um, award statement because I think it encapsulates Tom Neff's life. Tom, the no Tom Neff Award and the awardee last year was Mike Levy, is for the senior student who demonstrates unique humanitarian concerns towards the he total health and well-being of patients with unrelenting patience and compassion. And I really feel that perhaps as one of the heirs of Tom's legacy, that uh, embodying those really vital attributes of the master clinician, clinician scientist, are things that we would do well to remember uh, in our work together. As I hand it back to my colleague to introduce Mark, I also want to just remind us the uh, wealth of talent that has visited us over more than the last decade. Um, we have some work to do on diversity when it comes to representation among speakers. Uh, I think uh, we, we, are, we have work still cut out for us, but uh, we have certainly had expertise. Uh, Yasha Schneider, Mike Yanuzi, amongst other, Dean Shepard, and Naftali Kaminsky. And we have not had a NEF lecture for the last two years. And so Mark's joining us today really marks for this institution and our division a, an effort to reestablish some return to a new normalcy. And so Mark, not only is it great to have you here and we'll have you formally introduced, but really to identify this as a transition for our academic uh, existence in this institution. Welcome again. Thanks, Ivor. I appreciate that. Um, and now I do have the pleasure of uh, introducing the one of the uh, true master clinicians in the room with us here today, Dr. Mark Geraci. Um, Mark is a longtime member of the Colorado family uh, who left uh, not that long ago, 
Um, so it was well known around here. He was an undergrad at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, he then did his medical school at Johns Hopkins, where he was AOA. He did his internship and residency training at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and then came here, uh, returned here in 1990 as a pulmonary fellow. Um, he stayed at Colorado for a very long time and had a very illustrious career here, um, which he then took to Indiana. But while he was here at Colorado, he served as the director of the Genomics Shared Resource for the CCTSI, and ultimately was the co-director of the CCTSI itself. He was the director of the translational medicine program here at UC Denver. He was an assistant chief of medicine. And he also was, as many remember, the head of the division of pulmonary and critical care medicine for over a decade here at Colorado. In 2015, he went to Indiana to be the chair of medicine and professor of medicine there. And then uh, for a five year tenure, and most recently has gone to the University of Pittsburgh, where he's the associate vice chancellor for interdisciplinary research in the health sciences and a professor of medicine in Pittsburgh. Uh, he's trying to stand up, but he sent me 26 pages. I've narrowed it down to three. So one more to go here. Uh, Mark has been uh, really renowned throughout his career. He has been well uh, honored for these things, starting out being Phi Beta Kappa, AOA. He's an educator. He was the teacher of the year. He is a master clinician. He was the physician of the year in the early 2000s uh, and continues in that vein today. He has been the uh, president of the ASP and as well as the chair of the education committee. His publication record speaks for itself. He has over 100 publications on a range of topics, many on pulmonary arterial hypertension, basic as well as cl clinical manifestations, as well as on precision medicine. He has mentored over 50 very successful uh, people who have then spread their uh, uh, talents across the world, and across the country. He's received millions in research, starting with his first award in 1993, uh, and after that period, he has been continuously funded. He currently is funded with an R24, a U01, an R25. And to Dr. Douglas's last point, um, has a very interesting pending award out there, which is to start the first program at Pitt, which is designed to increase representation in the basic and clinical sciences, as well as to increase the connection of the institution to its local community. It really is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Tracy to the NEF lectureship today. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be back here. So thanks to Mark Moss and others for inviting me now a couple years ago, but the pandemic intervened. Um, I always like to start my lectures with a little bit of history. So this is the pulmonary division in 1972. And uh, over here is Tom Neff, uh, Mike Eisman, Tom Petty, Lakshmi, Len, Marvin Schwartz, uh, I think Rick is over here on the side as well, but this is Tom Neff, and as you've heard, he's a quintessential physician, educator, uh, really a wonderful teacher, uh, and a humanitarian, and everybody gives one or two stories about Tom, but one that I'll give that shows his humanity is as he was undergoing a bronchoscopy because he was having recurrent pneumonias with the recurrence of his disease, uh, a young fellow at the time took a biopsy. There was a massive amount of bleeding. This fellow knows who he is, Ed. And uh, Tom reached over in the, in the setting of this massive hemoptysis and grabbed his hand and said, your pulse tells me you're really upset. I'll be okay. Uh, so that's a quintessential Tom story. So uh, I have some disclosures. They're mainly in the realm of what's been funding the research of late. So the R24, a U01, which is called PVD omics, and then several top med grants that we'll talk about moving forward. The learning objectives, really, we're going to go briefly over sort of the new state of the art in terms of current guidelines for diagnosis and treatments of PAH. We'll talk about these major efforts that the NHLBI has undertaken since about 2010 toward understanding this disease in a much more strategic manner. And then we'll talk about some of the challenges kind of moving forward. Overview of the topics briefly, we'll go through the diagnosis treatment current state. We're gonna go back to the future. We're gonna say, what did we want to do in 2010? And are we at all close to thinking about uh, what we did. I'll give three examples from the laboratory group. Uh, we'll give you updates on the pulmonary hypertension breakthrough initiative, which is still ongoing in the PVD omics. We'll start with a case. This is a case that was sent to me from Anna Hemnes at Vanderbilt. This is a 
then 39-year-old woman who presented with syncope to Vanderbilt. She had a sister who had died of pulmonary arterial hypertension. The family had a known mutation in BMPR2. She did not have any evidence of parenchymal lung disease or any embolic evidence. Her echo at the time was relatively classic for very severe pulmonary hypertension with a right atrium that was dilated. The RV was severely dilated and severely depressed in function. Her right heart cath at the time showed astronomical pulmonary artery pressures, a normal pulmonary capillary reg pressure, very depressed cardiac index, and a PVR that was also uh, quite elevated. She was started on IV epoprostenol. Nine years later, she represented, not represented, but in follow-up, she had started sildenafil in addition to her intravenous epoprostenol, and she was enrolled in this trial, the PVD-omics trial, which is a trial to observationally measure multiple things. We'll talk about that. But in the interim, she developed obesity, hepatic steatosis. She still had no evidence of parenchymal lung disease. Her echo showed some improvement in the right ventricular function. And her more recent right heart cath showed some improvement in pulmonary artery numbers, but now a pulmonary capillary reg pressure of 31. So this begs the question, which group this WSPH is World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension. It's a group that meets every five years. Um, and as I'm fond of saying, it's just a, a group of people that go to really cool places and think about pH. But they do put out the guidelines uh, for pulmonary hypertension in the most recent iterations we'll go over. But arguing for group one, which is contains the hereditary version, she had a known mutation in this gene, uh, at presentation, she met all the criteria. But now, years on, there's an argument for group two, which is uh, you know, an elevated uh, left heart failure or left heart disease with an elevated wedge. So can a patient be in more than one group? How can patients' phenotypes change over time? And what's the best treatment for this patient moving forward? And so we'll talk about these complexities by way of this case moving forward. So overview of the diagnosis and treatments, there's been some terrific summary work, and I'll quote it. This is one by uh, Benicio de Jesus Perez, who was actually a fellow in our program here before he moved to Stanford, that summarizes these world uh, symposium findings from 2019. And the big news at the time was that the criteria were dropped so that pulmonary hypertension was defined as less than 20 millimeters of mercury down from 25. The genetic risk was expanded to include all of the newer genes that had been discovered to be associated with pH. And that a definitive statement was made that people in group two and group three, and remember group Two is the left heart failure group, and group three is the other lung disease group, including hypoxia, so things like interstitial lung diseases, sleep apnea syndromes, and the like are in group three, as well as interstitial lung diseases, should not be treated with um, specific pH therapies. They actually can do a lot worse. Group four is the embolic group, the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and a push was made to refer them early to centers where thromboenterorectomy can be done. Uh, and group five is multifactorial, but also includes the hemoglobinopathies. In addition, for group one patients, it was really strongly suggested to risk stratify these patients based on registries that had been done. Uh, Todd Bull and Dave Badish did a lot of work in this field uh, to risk stratify these. And so there was a low intermediate and high risk groups. These were broken down by World Health Organization functional class, which you all know about, the six minute walk distance, which is a complex metric that's used commonly to follow these patients, levels of biomarkers, NT pro BNP and also BNT, and you can see the levels there that divide these right atrial pressure measurements, cardiac index measurements. This is a really complicated slide, and the bottom line take home message is refer to them to a center that cares for these patients all the time. Uh, but for those of you taking boards in the near future, remember that under initial evaluation, they undergo a vasodilator trial. If they have vasoreactivity, they're not treated with vasoactive drugs. They're treated with chronic uh, calcium channel blocker therapy. We don't understand the mechanism very well, but these people do, by and large, relatively well. 
If they're non-vasoreactive, we stratify them into those risk groups. And we begin, if they're not very severe, with oral therapy. If they're intermediate, maybe combination oral therapies. And if they're at high risk, that's when the intravenous and inhalational routes come into play. Bottom line, send them to a center if you can where this is, uh, they can receive expert care because it's become a very complicated disease. Paul Hassoun's group at Johns Hopkins, and Paul in particular has done a great summary of PAH that was just published less than uh, five months ago. Um, and he talks about some of the global issues around PAH. It's estimated that approximately 1% of all people in the world develop PH over their lifetime. This is a disease that's more prevalent in aged individuals. 10% of all cases are in people over the age of 65. In group one, that's that group that contains what we used to call idiopathic, familial, toxin-associated, drug-associated, their own group one. There's a much higher incidence in women it's called sexual dimorphism. We have a much higher incidence in women. We still don't fully understand the reasoning behind that. But the predominant number of cases occur in underdeveloped countries, and they have limited access to medical therapy. So it's a big problem globally. Inside of the U.S., 80% identify as non-Hispanic white, 11% African American, and 10% Hispanic American. African American populations are about two and a half times more likely to have an associated connective tissue disease, and Hispanics have a much higher incidence of congenital heart disease leading to the pH. So these are, uh, when, when they say add some questions, I like true-false and I like easy true-false. So hereditary PAH is always caused by a mutation in one particular gene. I think you guys will recognize that that's false. Uh, and now more than 25 genes have been identified that are associated with hereditary form of PAH. So there are a large number of genes. It is an autosomal dominant transmission with incomplete penetrance. What that means is if you inherit the mutation, you may or may not get the disease. So there's a lot of modifier possibilities that uh, go into this as well. And it has sexual dimorphism. It has a female predominance. So it's complicated uh, genetics. This is a list that's from Paul's publications of the current genes implicated in pulmonary hypertension that are mutated in their pathway analysis. So as individuals began to sequence, and now we have whole genome sequences, we found that many of these fall into signaling pathways in and around the BMPR2 gene. This is the in the TGF beta super family receptor. About 80% of all hereditary cases have mutations in this particular gene. And interestingly, one out of five individuals who do not have a family history actually have a mutation in this gene as well. So some scientific examples from the group. Uh, this is uh, uh, our work and the work with the Vanderbilt group to look at modifier genes. So we know Vanderbilt had an incredible contingent of families and affected individuals. They deeply phenotype them over a long period of time. And so our question was, could there be modifier genes? If you have the mutation and you don't have the disease, um, we called those uh, control individuals who had the mutation. These individuals were aged and they didn't have any phenotype of pH. We wanted to look at uh, prostacyclin synthase. This is a gene uh, that we've studied for a long time. It's a gene that uh, Gao and I cloned. I see Gao in the back. I think in 1993, Gao, so almost 30 years ago, we cloned this gene. And uh, we've been working on the promoter and the regulatory regions of this gene. And we found that there were many different possible genetic variations which were functional. Each of you in inherits a different level of this enzyme that makes prostacyclin in your body. So we wondered, we asked the hypothesis, could this act as a modifier gene? And we had this at-risk population. We had people with the mutation and the disease and people with the mutation and didn't have the disease. And if you think this doesn't really have any basis, it turns out the arterial tortuosity syndrome, which this is an infant with uh, uh, ATL, uh, ATS, has this very tortuous aorta, and it was found in this family to be caused by a very rare repeat in the promoter. So there are these VNTR regions, 
variable, variable number of tandem repeats. They are um, nine nucleotides in length. They represent an SP1 binding site, so they're transcriptionally active. And this poor uh, little person inherited eight VNTRs tandemly when the family had six. So this is work with what was published now some time ago, but was very interesting. And Bob Stearman headed a lot of this work. And so this is the minimal promoter region that carries a lot of functional activity for prostacyclin synthase. It's just over 300 base pairs long. You'll recognize the start codon and immediately adjacent this region of tandem repeats, just one after another after another. They're nine base pairs in length. They always have the same sequence. Uh, although we found some variety there. And despite the fact that this is a really tight genetic piece of landscape, it's only 300 base pairs long, you would think that that would be in strong linkage disequilibrium. It would always get inherited in the same fashion. But it's in a recombination hotspot. There's a high GC content to the DNA, and a lot of recombination events occur in this very small region. So it's very complex genetically. So what we found, and I won't show you all of the data, is that the longer the VNTR repeat length is, the higher level of prostacyclin synthase expression and the higher levels of prostacyclin uh, and proteins. And so all VNTRs shift to the shorter repeats in the peak pulmonary hypertension versus control. So if you make less prostacyclin, have less of this enzyme in your lung, you're a little bit at a higher, uh, you, you have a different classification. And in the carriers, they have an unusual allele, which is more active. So if you're a carrier and you don't have the gene, you're more likely to have this uh, SNP, which actually is more active, generates more prostacyclin, if you will, in their lungs. And this is data on the RNA levels and the protein levels of the differences. So higher levels of the protein in the lungs of the people that are frankly more protected from this. So in our hands, we believe it could be a modifier gene in the disease. In terms of treatment, this uh, is from Paul's paper as well, so just five months ago, and unfortunately, not much has really changed in the last 20 years three major pathways that we attack, the endothelin pathway, the prostacyclin pathway, then the nitric oxide pathway. They each in their own way have vasodilatory effects and they decrease proliferation. And here's the list of currently approved drugs in each of these pathways. So very nice, as you guys know, New England Journal does a wonderful job with graphics and it's a great review paper uh, just out five, five months ago. Previous work we've done, um, this is one of the first papers that our group did, Ruben Tudor and Norbert Vogel, looking at the expression of this enzyme, and we demonstrated the expression is diminished in lungs of patients that had the disease. I think this is still my highest quoted paper. Um, and then uh, along with York Miller and others, we were able to generate these transgenic mice after we clone the gene and we show that if you crank on the transgene in the lung of these mice, they can't get and don't get pulmonary hypertension. So this is the last true false question. Some forms of pulmonary hypertension have features of cancer. So the answer to this is true. And this is actually a discovery that came out of Colorado in 1996. And Norbert's group and Rubin, uh, they found that the endothelial cells in the lungs of patients are monoclonal in origin. They found through looking at X chromosome inactivation that many of the endothelial cells in these plexiform lesions uh, are monoclonal. And more recently, Sebastian Benet's group has done a really great job of explaining a potential hypothesis. Stress causes these endothelial cells to undergo apoptosis. There's a number of adaptive mechanisms and this wheel represents the cancer paradigm of what happens in cancers. The solid lines are, we have direct evidence that this occurs. The hash lines are that we think we have some evidence. But I'm gonna talk down here about this genomic instability, which they have as a hash line, but I think we have a lot more evidence that actually does occur. So this is work we did just about, um, 10 years ago now, a little over that, 
uh, with Michaela Aldred and um, Serpil Ezrim at the Cleveland Clinic. And we had at the time access to endothelial cell cultures from individuals with this disease, from explanted lungs. We also had their lungs. So we could look at the cells in culture in early passage and at the lungs. We knew from work that Serpil and others had done that these cells had very aggressive growth properties. They were aberrant. They really prolifer proliferated quite a bit. And our concept was we could use SNP arrays. So it was an early form of comparative genomic hybridization. We could take a normal 2N cell from the individual and compare it to the endothelial cells and then examine across the entire genome for amplifications and deletions in selected regions of genes. We could confirm this by uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization. We had a great group here doing that work in cancer at the time. We could also look at the uh, lung tissue as well. So this is an example from an individual that has chromosomal loss on, uh, in parts of chromosome 13. And it turns out that this was in the region of the retinoblastoma gene. So they lost the retinoblastoma gene, a tumor suppressor gene, in the endothelial cells. These are the cell culture results. This red marks the retinoblastoma gene. The green is a more distal part of chromosome 13. The aqua color is a control. It's off of another chromosome, chromosome 8. So you can see under the microscope where you've got one, you always should have two aqua signals showing that the interphase chromosome prep was done correctly, but you see various amounts of loss of this region of chromosome 13. Now, not all the cells have it, but about five or 10% do. When you go into the tissue, it's only the endothelial cells that have the loss. This is uh, uh, red, green, and then aqua. And there's not all of them, but some of them. None of the smooth muscle cells have this. None of the fibroblasts have this. So it seems like a proportion of the cells have chromosomal instability in the lungs of these patients in these plexiform lesions. So what do we think 10 years ago, now 12 years ago, we had a big strategic work group for the lung vascular research at the NIH. A large number of people participated and we produced recommendations to the NIH. What should we be thinking about doing? And the recommendations can be boiled down to, we should utilize the emerging technologies that were there in 2010. They've even come much further along. We should foster new collaborations through a mechanism that gets groups together. We should work in research consortia. We should do systems biology analysis through the emerging field of multiple omics, and we should do a better job of both molecular characterization and clinical phenotyping of all individuals with this disease. So one of the things that we started here with a lot of collaborations is what's called the Pulmonary Hypertension Breakthrough Initiative, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. This is a, a large initiative that was initially funded by the American Heart Association through the CMREF, the Cardiovascular Medical Research and Education Fund. So for seven years, we got this up and running. For the next seven years, we were funded by the NHLBI through the R24. And I'm happy to say this continues as a resource to the uh, scientific investigative field in terms of cell lines and lung tissues by generous annual uh, funding through CMREF. Um, when we got started, we had a number of transplant and processing partners across the country at, uh, at all these different places. We had a great tissue core at the University of Alabama. Uh, Ruben and I were here doing uh, both tissue processing and genomics. The coordinating clinical center was at the University of Michigan. We collected tissues in ways that we thought we could best preserve them for future studies. We didn't know what the future looked like, so we took blood in all these different forms and, gen and, and basically thinking that in the future we're going to need ways to do proteomics, genomics, microRNA analysis. The lung tissue that we have, we processed and stored in many different ways, including things like melonic solution for immunoelectron microscopy uh, and many different ways and blocks that were prepared. 
we had cells. The entire left lung was taken at the time of transplant and cell lines were derived, uh, adventitial cells, smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells from different sized arteries. And these are all still available to you uh, as researchers. And then about halfway through, we also took explanted heart tissue uh, for all these different things. So this is this uh, is a living biobank, if you will. We still have uh, almost every individual, the way we collected them, we still have samples from every individual. This is just a graphic sample of where individuals have uh, taken the tissues and done investigations. These are all the different institutions uh, as of two years ago that have utilized the tissues for studies. And this is av of a couple of years ago, how many publications were generated from this grant? Uh, and at the time it was about 284 publications. It's well over 300 publications from this central resource that we developed uh, here at Colorado. Again, you can still do this. Michaela, I, I uh, handed this off after I left Indiana. Uh, Michaela Aldred is now in charge. She's doing a wonderful job. So if you are interested in obtaining any of the tissues, uh, M.A. Aldred at IU.edu, and she's got a great setup to be able to get you tissues, cells, plasma, and the like. So one last example from our lab. We were always very interested in gene expression analysis, and we had done a very large set of gene expression. We'd done them on microarrays. We've done them in RNA-seq. Uh, and then we thought, boy, this is getting very difficult. How can you publish a gene expression study in 2019? It's very hard to do, not much novelty. So we partnered with Steve Chan at Pittsburgh uh, and Sun Jung Kim at Stanford to look at things in a new way, in a new informatics approach because we've done these uh, really large gene expression studies. So this is just the standard old fashioned heat map showing a difference between pulmonary hypertension and control lungs. Our control lungs were failed donor lungs, lungs that came from individuals that still had great oxygenation, but they either had a size differential or an immunogenic differential. So we use those as control lungs. You can find genes that correlate with physiology. So we found selected genes that have tremendous correlation with mean pulmonary artery pressure, either in a decreasing or increasing way. Rubin's group had done a great job of categorizing inflammation. So we found some gene markers of inflammation in the whole genome uh, expression of the lungs that correlated extraordinarily well. But what we did, which I think was really exciting in uh, getting together with Steve's group at Pittsburgh, was to look at uh, an evaluation of differential dependencies, which is examines networks and gene sets in the reactome. So Steve and Sunjan did this with us and for us. And so uh, graphically, if you know you have pulmonary hypertension or failed donors, you have these reactomes which are known. They're in large databases. You can ask the question, in the disease, and the control lungs, are there statistically significant differences in these gene sets? You do this for pure mutation testing, and you can find selected gene sets, which are uh, either uh, pulmonary hypertension specific dependent or non. And then you can display these differential dependency networks uh, on these different gene sets. So again, complicated data, but what really is interesting of these differentially uh, displayed networks, more than 40%. So here's these four. We found 16 reactomes that were highly statistically different. Here are four that are entirely novel, not been described in other diseases or in other reactome databases. And then here are some that are very much already associated, the TGF-beta receptor pathway signaling system. Remember, I told you BMPR2 uh, lives in this superfamily and uh, uh, activation of ERF3 and the TLR3 pathway also known. What Steve's gone on to do with this data set, which has been really great, is to take the data set and say, let's layer on top of these networks known drugs that target these networks and see if statistically we can figure out new drugs and new classes of drugs uh, to look at in pulmonary hypertension. So his group has come up with two very strong candidate genes, and they're working through preclinical trials and early clinical trials for new classes of treatments. 
uh, in this disease. What about this PVD omics? So PVD omics is pulmonary, pulmonary vascular disease omics, and it's a multi-center trial to try to not only phenotype, but multiple omics applied to uh, these individuals. This is the major group. This is how it was when we got started in 2014. We had clinical centers. Uh, we had cardiovascular and pulmonary phenotyping centers. We had biorepository centers. We had a steering committee. Todd's on the steering committee still, I think, I hope, uh, on the, on the uh, safety monitoring board. Clinical centers at the Brigham and Columbia and Cornell, Hopkins, the Mayo Clinic, Arizona, and Vanderbilt. And we had specific hypotheses that we wanted to test. I won't be belabor these too much because I'll tell you that here we are now eight years on and we're still working to answer a lot of these questions. But the idea was to deeply phenotype individuals and then measure their genomes, their transcriptomes, their proteomes, their metabolomes, um, deeply image these individuals, including our MRIs, uh, CT scans, uh, lots of clinical chemistry and physiology. All these people underwent exercise physiology as well. And for our primary classification. I've enumerated the groups in a much more detailed fashion. I'll leave it to you. But group one, we had left heart disease. Uh, group three, the lung disease. Group four, the obstruction disease. And group five. We initially set out to equally enroll in each one of the groups. And what you'll see is uh, that we were not able to do that. We were able to introduce a comparator group when the World Symposium changed their definition, we had a number of individuals who were on the mild side. Uh, they were uh, enrolled because they had a pressure above 20, but they were less than 25. So we call those the comparator group because it's a great way to say in a milder setting for each one of these groups, how does it look between established disease and um, impending disease, if you will. And our data set is kind of overwhelms TopMed and other groups because it has 2,100 data points. This is the protocol in brief. Uh, it's three different days over the course of six weeks. They undergo lots of research, blood draws, urine tests, hip weight ratios, EKGs, echocardiograms, full pulmonary function studies, six-minute walks. They undergo right heart catheterization. Uh, they undergo vasodilator trial. They undergo loading trials with saline or CPET. They have cardiac MRIs. And uh, again, high resolution CAT scans, VQ, VQ scans, and a number of these individuals, more than half have had sleep studies as well. I won't belabor the differences in the different groups, just to give you an idea of how many people were ultimately enrolled. We've completed enroll. We had 96 healthy controls. As you can imagine, these people are really healthy. They're quite a bit younger and very healthy. In this very important comparator group, we'll call it very mild disease, we had almost 350. And then in the pulmonary hypertension group, we enrolled and phenotyped 750. We've done a follow-on study called PVD omics long-term follow-up, where we've taken 500 individuals in the pH group and followed them up long-term over two years. So we have a replication of the data sets at two years for 500 of these individuals. Broken down by group, uh, we had the most in group one. Uh, group two, remember that's the lung, uh, the heart disease group. We had a, over 100. Group three was the lung disease group. We had a lot. We had very few in group four and group five. Not very many people presenting uh, that we could enroll in these groups. And what we found, this is just, uh, I think it's actually accepted for publication. Uh, what we found in sort of the clinical examination of this is that by World Symposium group, there's a difference in uh, long-term survival. With group one, which we used to think had a very poor survival prognosis, actually having one of the better prognostic indicators over time. Group three, that's the lung disease group. That's the group with COPD and interstitial lung disease. They tend to do the worst over time and various in between. Not earth shattering. Other groups have published data that's very similar to this. 
What we did, though, is deep phenotyping, and we found that across each of these groups, many, many people have different uh, categories that they can and do belong to. For example, in group two, left heart disease, almost 60% of these people are mixed. They have elements of other World Health Organization classifications. Here's an actionable thing that we found because we had about 60% of the individuals undergoing full sleep studies. We found that nighttime hypoxia dramatically affected survival. And so that these individuals probably routinely should be not only examined for uh, sleep studies, but probably treated uh, very aggressively for sleep disturbances because that does improve their uh, survival. The other thing that we did is we took all of the clinical variables, where there were a lot, and we reduced them down to, in, through a principal component analysis, about 80 clinical variables, which we thought very accurately distinguished survival. So these are now survival curves of these five different, we'll call them uh, clusters, but they're really survival groups. And the purple color, you'll see that there's a group that does very well long-term, extremely well over the course of five years. Very few people die. And those people can be in group one, they can be in group two, three, four, or five. The worst survival is in uh, the, the red and the gold clusters. And you can see that those clusters can be in either one or any of the um, pH groups. So one other way to think about the disease is who has a very severe disease, and you can see they spread, they have a phenotype defined by 80 different clinical variables, and they're across these clinical known groups. And some have a really terrific prognosis. We need to study them. We need to find out why they're so resilient, if you will. What we haven't been able to dig into yet, but most of the data has, uh, are, the experiments have been done, are multiple omics. So when we got started, this was PVD omics. We didn't have any money to do the omics. <laughs> That's not funny. We didn't know we didn't have the money. The NIH, as we uh, went along, said, you know, you're not going to have enough money to do these omics. So they encouraged us to apply uh, to the NHLBI top med program, and we've had three different awards. Uh, we have now completed whole genome sequ sequencing on all the samples, DNA methylation, and transcriptional uh, analysis by uh, RNA-seq on all of the samples. More importantly, we got approval and started the transcriptional evaluation of a lot of other samples. We have blood samples, pre-capillary and post-capillary blood samples in the same individual. What is the difference in transcriptional activity across the pulmonary bed, for example? Those are questions we're gonna be able to ask and answer. And more recently, since we have a lot of cell lines derived to be able to do single cell analysis, proteomics and beyond. So stay tuned. Uh, we have a lot of data coming, and hopefully we'll get a lot more uh, interesting information and potential therapeutic inputs moving forward. So in summary, pH is a very severe disease. It's complex. It's heterogeneous. And if you're able, send your patients to a great center like you have here in Colorado. We need new and creative treatment approaches for this disease. Um, multiple collaborative efforts are ongoing. Uh, we have developed these biorepositories for you and the informatics to use the data that we derive as well. What are the future challenges? We got to finish the omics and analyze it. We got to create more collaborative teams. We got to continue to work on clinical trial networks and protocol developments. And then as I think about it, I think we have to be smarter. I think we have to come up with newer and smarter combinations. We have to think about the disease the way that we did TB or HIV or cancer where multiple different targets need to be hit at the same time. We need to think outside of the box. There's a lot of evidence that immunology is disrupted in this. So immunotherapy, metabolism is disrupted. So metabolic therapies are on the table. Um, and in people that are high risk, they have mutations, they could go on to get the disease. We should think about treating them before they get the disease. And I think what we want to do is avoid what I call the whack-a-mole approach. New target, new pathway, new drug. It always ends up not being enough, right? There's always a resistance or a alternative pathway that comes up. So we've sort of got to get away from that paradigm. So with that, many thanks to the team.
this group of incredibly talented individuals that I recruited to Indiana and then left, but they're doing wonderful. Um, collaborators from afar, that includes a lot of people that have been uh, here, the PBHBI group, the PVD Omics group, and then a lot of alumni of the lab uh, over time that have done a tremendous amount of work uh, in this space. And I never uh, end a lecture without thanking the most important people. And this is the Familia Geraci. So this is my wife, uh, Kathy, and I, uh, our oldest son, Chris, his wife, Lindsay, our two grandkids from them, Marie uh, and Nick, our second son, Nick, his wife, Kate. They have the three girls, um, Sadie and Harper and Avery. Her, when we took the helmet off, her hair was blonde. It was really cool. Uh, and actually, Kate is due to have a baby in two weeks, number four, to this uh, group. Uh, again, my grandson, Nick. My son, Max. This is us just this past summer uh, up at Maroon Bells. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Leave you with a Yogi Berra-ism. That's great, Mark. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in on the chat here, but I think this room could probably fill our time with other questions. I'll start with one that I have here while people are sort of getting warmed up. Lumpers and splitters, five who classes. Uh, somebody in the audience wants to know how long are those going to continue to be valuable if it seems like your disease severity can span across class? Um, you know, that's a fantastic question. I think that it still helps us define Treatments. So in other words, we, we understand in, you know, if you're in selected groups, what treatments tend to work better or worse. And it's been ingrained in the culture and it officially got developed in 98, was it, Kurt, when we first did those? Uh, the second world symposium in Nice. Uh, Fran no, no, no. It was in Avion. Avion, France in 1998 were the first five classifications. So it's going to be hard historically to un uproot that. But I think we need to look at it more meaningful in terms of prognosis, therapeutic efficacy, and things like that. Carl, what are you doing? It's so interesting. And, and as you point out, the disease is far more heterogeneous than we thought. And so there are our people, Martin Wilkins just published a paper, I, I don't know if you've seen it, you know, about um, it, is it time for reclassification of the taxonomies? I mean, to just break down all of those groups and go to more molecular profiling and and um, Sugu and Andrea and Ruben and I just have a paper under submission um, that challenges the whole idea that this is a good good way to go. So if we're gonna cure the disease, like you say, and identify it early on, we need to do molecular characterizations. The liquid biopsies in particular haven't been that helpful because they've been based on, oh, well, this, this is group one patient, we're gonna you know, do the usual things. So how are we going to be, go back to the beginning of the disease and look at the molecular heterogeneity, which is increasingly coming out that patients with group one PAH, PVOD, doesn't really have anything to do with idiopathic PAH. There's been two papers where they studied the molecular biology of that. So when, how do you think we'll convince people to really reconsider this as a more complex disease and not lump them into categories that we almost started in? Yeah, 73? that's a great question. Part of the problem is in order to get the pathogenic tissue, the lungs have to be out of the patient, right? You don't biopsy these people. And uh, they're by then at the time of transplant and they're very end, end stage. So we have probably the largest collection of those with the PHBI, um, but it's only about 180. So it's a small sample to say in whole lung genomics or um, single nuclei, you know, we've done all kinds of fancy things uh, from the early days. Can you make determinations? And the answer is it's really hard. You know, um, it's a small number and it's hard to get numbers uh, that can give you sort of what you want. It, for, in our hands, at a molecular level, there probably are three molecular groups. Um, but again, we don't have large enough numbers to know what they are. Uh, and oddly enough, the familial form, the hereditary form, is the major driver of one of those groups. So there's something about mutations in that pathway 
that drive whole lung gene expression into its own arm, if you will. Um, but that's about as much as we could discern from a couple hundred cases. What we have is the ability with this multiple omics to its liquid biopsies, it's, it's blood, it's, you know, we have proteome, we have metabolome, we have all those things. And so I think that's probably going to be one of the ways we characterize it is uh, through these uh, surrogate tissues. And, you know, and Todd was one of the first people to publish papers on blood transcriptional um, looking at, you know, different phenotypes, scleroderma included in pulmonary hypertension. I think it, it was the first paper now that I think about it. Um, so I think we're going to be back to that. And that was, you did that 20 years ago <laughs> or more. So, yeah. Mark, great talk. Um, so Kurt asked my first question far more eloquently than I could have. Um, uh, but I was interested in sort of the genetic uh, distribution. Since there are so many genetic variants, do they define a phenotype? Um, but, the, but the second question relates to the point that you brought up early in your talk, which is individuals moving from one category to another. And um, and do you do you think that that will be more stable if you look at if you define individuals in terms of a molecular phenotype? I, I do. I think that you know other ways to sort of, as Kurt said, blow up the classification system is to you know is there are there cleaning cl you know clinically meaningful variables that define effectively prognosis, right? Like if we know at the outset you have this combination. This treatment, which is relatively standard, you're going to have an extraordinary good prognosis. We don't know what underlies that great prognosis. And then we have, you know, these five distinct survival curves, right? And they're across all the five different ones. But maybe that's a place to start to say there is something about this terribly difficult survival group uh, at, a, at a, you know, clinically variable level uh, that we need to not only think about in terms of mechanism of action, but uh, targeted drugs to help get them better. And that group does include the lung diseases, the parenchymal lung diseases. So maybe that's a major driver, but um, it helps us think about this. Mark, thank you again for a great talk. Um, could you, the question is about the correlation between functional survival and the outcome uh, that you showed us in the time to event analyses. Using multi omics, you showed us that you can cluster in time to event groups that are phenotypically similar with death as the outcome. Should we assume that functional outcome correlates with that? Or is functional performance a useful separate outcome variable for doing multi-omic assessment? Because clearly these classes aren't all deteriorating at the same rate or have the same level of dysfunction. And for a theragnostic approach, perhaps we should be targeting people whose symptoms can be approved as well as just preventing them dying. I agree. I would defer to the master clinician in the front row in the beige suit, <laughs> Dr. Bull. <laughs> I didn't know I had to answer questions today. So the, um, well, we, we think, I guess when you're saying functional analysis, the thing that comes to mind is exercise tolerance, right? That, that's our sort of, has been our go-to forever um, in terms of, of both designing clinical trials initially and then kind of following patients forward. And Interestingly, it even though it's such a simple surrogate, it actually correlates very well with survival, um, uh, things along those lines. So I think that would give you probably more um, fidelity initially uh, to your, you know, to doing the analysis against, you'd have to guess, I don't know if you do tertiles or quartiles of six minute walk distances. There's all, of course, all things that mess that up. And um, it becomes a little different when you go across groups, for example. So, um, you know, the group three lung disease is a lot of COPD patients who then have other reasons why they can't walk, uh, you know, for long distances. So there are some problems when you start comparing across like this, but, um, but I do think that would be, yeah, one way maybe to improve fidelity a little, but, but I guess following up a, a little bit on that, or th this whole omics question mark, cause, cause I do think this, the PVD omics is, is really exciting and, uh, and the work that's coming across, that's going to be, uh, I think fantastic when it's released and, you know, it being part of the, the NHL BI, I mean that the discussions are now how other research labs can now get their hands on this data when it's when it's when it's released and how that's going to be parsed out. If you had to pick, you know, from your with your history of starting back in genomics, the thing that you're most excited at looking at out of this going forward, like where, like if, you know, you got one, you got one question you got to try to answer from this 
what would, what would you grab? And I give you, for example, for me, it would be a little bit of what you were alluding to, like who are the super responders? Like within, and in our clinics, there are patients who do fantastically well, you know, not even just the calcium channel blockers, but the others, but I can, we can never look at them up front and say, you're going to do great. And everyone else but among our three drugs, you know? So, so that to me would be a really interesting question, parsing out the super responders, if you will, um, and figuring out what's wrong with, with them. But I don't know, I was kind of curious, you know, if you got to pick now, uh, what what we go after, or what the the main question you would ask, what would that be? That's like the hardest question of the day. <laughs> so the, it's the Yogi Berra. If you ask me something, I don't know. I'm not going to answer. Actually, I can't pull that one. I, I you know I think that it's going to be this much more integrated, high level analysis that is tied to potential targeted pathways. So some of the stuff Steve's doing, Steve Chan, and this ability with multiple omics to sort of say, okay, these are perturbations that are not only not previously described in diseases or the well state, they're very novel. And oh, by the way, here's a series of drugs that could you know, uh, target this unusual thing that's happening in the disease. So I think it's this intersection of uh, genomics and therapeutic opportunities that I would uh, be most excited to look at across a large data set. One of the uh, audience questions has to do with the therapeutics question. Of the three classes of therapeutics that you sh have shown, which do you think still has the highest ceiling? So where, where are we going to get the most bang for our buck versus which do we understand the best and we sort of know what it can do for us? So I, uh, I think I don't know. That's a great question. But I think that the prostacyclin pathway is the first. It's the one we started, and it's probably still the best in terms of long-term uh, outcome. Now, you know, there's been different formulations of it. Um, and the others have similar properties um, and are probably easier to give and less toxic. So, um you know, I think we're finding these are dirty drugs, right? They don't just hit one receptor. They hit multiple. They have differing effects that we're just starting to understand. So um, I think by hook or by crook, we landed on three really great uh, categories of drugs. Uh, but I think there are many more that are out there. But I, I still think we kind of push along in the, I don't know, the guys who take care of these patients. Where do you see the advance coming? Uh, and I think what what most are the most excited about right now is modulation of the the BMP R two pathway and and um, you know the, there's a, a new drug Sertanicept that um, was in a phase two study um, uh, essentially showed marked improvement in PVR which interestingly the hemodynamics have never been great surrogates for us in outcomes I think to, to Ivor's point like to, you would think okay this is a hemodynamic disease we can measure the hemodynamics and parse all our patients that way and um, even though we measure those a lot, that hasn't worked out as well as functional six minute walk, but, but, but modulating that pathway is kind of where most excitement is in terms of what's coming down the path, what's coming down. But um, treatment wise, yeah, the prostanoids have been our go-to drug uh, for everyone. When things are falling apart, that's what we reach for. So, you know, the question becomes, should we just throw those in earlier? That's what, uh, that's what that Maybe one of the other questions we have here gets at that, should we throw things in earlier? The revision of the definition, of PAH, you know, 20 to 25, dropping that down. Is that in your mind a good thing, a bad thing? The pros outweigh the cons? I think overall it's probably a good thing because I think treating earlier is better. I think it. there were staunch individuals who were tied to higher pressures and um, and there was, a, <laughs> there was a lot of kerfluffle, I'll just put it that way, around this change. Uh, but I think it gives an opportunity for more individuals to be treated earlier. It's complex politically because the drug companies make a lot more money when that change occurred. Um, but I think that treating earlier is always better. I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, we, we don't have the luxury of a large group of individuals to study like they do in cardiovascular health. We have to sort of, it's a rare disease. We have to go with smaller groups. Uh, and I think the trials are getting much, much more well-designed in terms of meaningful outcomes and things like that. So I, I have a lot of hope. We have one last question. I think it'll be a quick one. Came from the primary care group. Are there any of these gene uh, irregularities that are worth screening for at birth or any common enough? 
fantastic question. The answer is no. Um, so um, it's such a rare disease. The American College of Genetics, Medical Genetics, goes through and sort of ranks each of these genes as, yeah, this is definitely causative. And of that 25, not all 25 are in that category. There are only about six. But because of the rarity, they don't recommend screening. Um, early. In fact, um, because it's got incomplete penetrance, you may have the mutation and never, ever in your lifetime get the disease. In fact, that's as likely to happen as not. So it, it's really a strange one in that it's not like cystic fibrosis at all. Um, it, it's very different. You, you may have this mutation and never get the disease, uh, even though it's autosomal dominant. Great. Well, it's one o'clock, so I want to make sure we're respectful of everybody's time. Yours included, Dr. Dracy. Thank you very much. And it's really nice to actually be able to do this in person. So thanks for coming today. Appreciate it. Thanks again.